Hello, hello, and welcome to another episode of the Ice Cream for Everyone podcast. Thank you very much for joining me today. Uh, it's again a beautiful, lovely weather and blue skies out of my new, brand new window, a brand new ice cream HQ in London. Uh, however, at the same time, not so great news. I mean, at the time I'm recording this, and uh, by the time it's published, we'll probably have more details. Extremely sad news coming from uh, right next door, right next to the other side of the channel from Brussels. Uh, bomb attacks at the airport and in the metro, an awful number of injured and, and, and dead people as I'm recording this. So uh, so my thoughts, of course, go to the people in Brussels and uh, and everywhere else, uh, the families and close ones, the people that are no longer with us. Uh, one more horrible, horrible event. I mean, I, I remember how it touched me, the, the events in Paris only a few months ago, right? Uh, and I grew up in Paris, and a lot of these attacks happen right next door. And Brussels is right next door; and it's the the heart of all the political Europe. Uh, so, you know, I don't care. As I said, this is not particularly about current events. This podcast is not about that, but it's another terrifying terror attack. And I guess beyond thoughts and and well wishes to the people in Brussels and and everywhere around, and all their families and close ones uh, to the victims, all I can say is, don't fall into the the hate and fear mongering trap. Some are almost certainly already, by the time this is published, there's already going to be some people talking about it. Certainly use that hate and fear mongering. Well, the perpetrator, the, 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 the people who led these attacks, these terror attacks to start with, because that's their, that's their main methodology. That's what they want. They want people to react in hate and fear so that it justifies more what they're doing. And other people are certainly going to be using that to their own political and public promotional advantages. So, you know, don't fall into that trap. Let's just be together. I know that there's not really anything more to say about this. Uh, it, it's a horrible, horrible event. Uh, it, it's, and it's horrible that becoming increasingly normal. The, I don't even know how to react because it's, you're seeing that through the lens of the news, seeing that through the lens of a few videos online and tweets. Uh, and it's so close and so far away, but yeah, so that, that's all I have to say about that. There's not really much. I just want to acknowledge the fact that we live in a world where there's horrible events going on. I don't think this one is more or less horrible than what's been going on in other countries, such as Mali, uh, and of course what's going on in Syria. So all of them are equally horrible. So I'm not trying to say one place is more deserving of horrible attention than another. Uh, but that's just the main piece of news that are that's happening right now that I'm seeing up, you know, updated in the in the mainstream news. So so that's the one that's affecting and talking about right now. So just at the time of recording, uh, I don't promise I'm going to talk about current events all the time, but I kind of like record these intros talking about what's happening. So that's what's happening right now. Uh, but anyway, uh, on on to today's on to today's show. On to like back to the blue skies and the weather and and interesting stuff to talk about. Uh, one day I might have a guest that's more interested, that's more uh, knowledgeable about current politics or even terrorism to talk about that kind of stuff or communicating in that environment. Uh, but for now, uh, let's, let's keep to our usual topics. And uh, if ever you're listening to this for the first time, this is a show that's got nothing to do with terror attacks and it's got nothing to do with politics. It's got nothing to do with all that stuff or, or very little to do with that anyway so far. Uh, and in the show, I interview creators and thinkers from a variety of different backgrounds that I'm either both, well, professionally and personally interested in. So I'm a marketing and brand strategist. So the people I interview tend to work in planning and strategy and advertising, marketing and media. And I'm also a keen tabletop uh, gamer. So I love board games, tabletop games, role-playing games. I love video games and all kinds of play and game uh, formats. So I interview game designers and find out about their inspiration as well. You can find the show on all the usual podcast channels. I mean, I don't know how you're listening right now. It could be iTunes, could be Stitcher. If you do check the show out on those, or please leave a rating and a review. If you enjoy the show, listen to one episode, at least one, uh, two, ideally, uh, or even three while we're at it. Let's go crazy. And um, if you enjoy it, check out iTunes. Even if you don't use iTunes, you got to have iTunes. Check out iTunes or Stitcher. And leave a rating or review. It really helps other people find the show. And I would be enormously, hugely grateful uh, if you do that. Uh, of course, you can also find all the episodes and a lot more ice cream goodies on my website. That's www.icecreamforeveryone.net. Everything spelled out. 
icecreamforeveryone.net. And you can also find my weekly uh, long-form email newsletter, uh, which I encourage you to sign up to. So there's a variety of topics happening every week. It changes every week. It's called Ice Cream Sunday and comes out, of course, every Sunday. Uh, and I usually have a mix of like kind of personal experiences and then expand from there in a variety of different topics. You can contact me if you have any questions or if you'd like to find out more about the show or, uh, or, or if you're looking for a strategist or if you're looking for advice for on how to uh, grow your brand or how to market your products or how to launch a new product from a marketing perspective, I'd be happy to help you. Uh, you can email me from the website. You can get in touch via Twitter. You can follow me on Twitter at I'm at Hippo Will on Twitter. Uh, and that's uh, about it for the uh, shameless promotion. Let's move on to talking about our guest today. Our guest today is Richard Huntington. Richard is the group strategy officer for Saatchi & Saatchi, a global advertising agency, uh, and he also writes and comments about the advertising and marketing industry and planning in his blog, Ad Literate. Uh, he's got a variety of fantastic articles, even though he says he's not. He's, I, I find him always extremely interesting. Uh, he both exposes a lot of different points of views about what's going on in marketing and advertising. Really, really smart stuff. Uh, and uh, and he's always great to talk to, extremely enthusiastic uh, about a variety of different ideas and about the industry altogether. Great storyteller. Uh, I caught up with Richard at the European Planning Conference in Prague, where we were both talking a few months ago. And, uh, and on the occasion, I asked if he'd be up for being on the podcast. So we, we met up in London, I uh, had a fantastic conversation about uh, how Richard got into planning and advertising, how he started in direct marketing, his early website design skills for the uh, society or club that he created with friends from university that they had fun together with at university. So uh, there's that. And that was quite fun. Uh, we talked about a, uh, a few different hot topics in advertising and marketing like ad blockers and content marketing. And, uh, and of course, we talked about tabletop games and gaming towards the end of the episode as well. So, without further ado, here's Richard Huntington. Enjoy. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much for taking the time. I really appreciate it. It's great to see you again. Oh, it's good to see you, mate. Yeah. Uh, so, I usually start these interviews with a warm-up question. And the warm-up question, it's half the time kind of just an excuse to... Mention something that I've found randomly while doing some research. And in this case, this is where the internet is really, really good sometimes. <laughs> I looked up your LinkedIn profile. I did a bit of stalking around. Uh, I didn't do as much like back reading of Adliterate as I would have liked, but you know, uh, and I found out that while you're studying in Cambridge, you're a part of a society called the Minotaurs. Yes. The Minotaurs. Yes. Yes. That apparently is, was, uh, self-proclaimed to promote, uh, wait, what did you say again? <laughs> the idea was, apparently. No. <laughs> no. You can't do this. <laughs> so what was it about? And why did you call yourselves like that? Oh, I do know. I mean, this is 30 years ago. And, uh, I, I think we were just a bunch of people at St. John's College, Cambridge who weren't invited to be part of any of the sort of posh dining clubs yeah. that, that sort of seem to be, you know, in vogue. And, and I mean, I guess cur currently have some infamy because of um, the antics of David Cameron and George Osborne at Oxford. Uh, so we created our own dining club, and it sounds really pathetic. But, Matt, we were like 20, 21. You've got to forgive us uh, for that. And but I do still uh, I'm still quite close to lots of those people who I met at the time. Um, uh, so I mean I'd love to. We used to go skiing together. Actually, it was really really good fun. But anyway, so that was really deep dark past, and God knows how you found that. <laughs> Are, aren't there things do you, you remember can do why now to eradicate your sort of <laughs> <laughs> online history? I have I have worse. I have no worse. because there's a website. Is there? Yes, there is a website oh. with photos from from. No, <laughs> <laughs> and there's a description. Okay, I think it. Well, there you can. There's deniability, if ever, because it's, it says Dicky Huntington. Yes, as the description of one of the members. Yes, Dicky is a planner and partner at Howell Henry Chaldicott Lurie, an ad agency in London. Oh, so fashionable Soho actually says that. 
he drinks a lot of cappuccino and like the rest of the agency goes around pretending he didn't uh, go to Oxbridge by wearing combat trousers and looking like an absolute oik. He doesn't believe in marriage, but is weighing up procreation against holidays, building a roof terrace, and not smelling of sick. He has got rid of his stupid haircut. Dickie is haunted by a blur of no hands bumpering, recitals of the letter, and bad dancing. Oxford One was a particular highlight as he woke up in the room of a student whose college we had invaded and who he had never met before. While on the skiing front, Teeny One stands oh, out for geez. sheer vileness. I mean, I wrote this shit. <laughs> You wrote yeah, yes, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure I wrote that. <laughs> like, I don't know, 15 years ago. This has got to be the beginning of the internet. I, I, like, try to crane my neck. To wait, see wait, wait, I'll show you the website. Oh, and oh are yes. These are photos. Yeah. I don't know if they're yeah, coming but I mean, look, later. That's, or? Well, no, that, but look at that. It's, it's sort of uh, internet circa 1998, yeah, yeah, yeah. isn't it? Just finding the website was fantastic. So I'm not connected with it. <laughs> <laughs> So the website has got a pink and blue uh, yeah, yeah. kind of like theme, which is, I mean, the, the website's amazing. It's, it is definitely 1 point or 0 0.0, I yeah. don't know exactly. Yeah. But it's great. It's like good effort. To start. <laughs> Do you remember why the name, Minotaurs? I don't really. No? Uh, I don't really know why. <laughs> we, had, we, okay. had, we had sort of a... I mean, we got as far as having a bow tie that was in Minotaur's colours. I mean, it, it, so it had its own sort of identity. But it wasn't one of those things that, you know, a lot of those dining clubs are perpetuated from generation to generation. That was just something that we did. And thank goodness, I think, has died a death. All right. Yeah. Well, let's back, backtrack a little bit further. Where, where are you from? Where'd you grow? Uh, I... I guess I grew up mainly in the southwest of England, in Devon and Somerset. I mean, I was born in Kent in the southeast, but I kind of moved to Devon and Somerset in the uh, when I was around seven, uh, and uh, and I sort of did my growing up there, particularly in Devon. And uh, we 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 uh, my father uh, was a farmer, and we'd moved to so he could look after a really interesting state in South Devon, which had been created in the 30s as a sort of utopian uh, um, rural community called Dartington. And um, uh, and we moved there. And I, I was very influenced, I think, by growing up in a slightly countercultural sort of 70s in, environment, um, most of which I then spent the following 10 years kind of rebelling against. Okay. Yeah. And what, what were your interests growing up? Or what kind of what kind of child were you? Uh, I, well, it's interesting because now I have a 12-year-old. I kind of think, oh, my goodness. I went to his parents' evening last night. I went, he is me. <laughs> Poor son. <laughs> uh, so I introverted, um, uh, very self-aware. Uh, I, I really adored drawing and cartoons in particular, although... Uh, I recently, my, my, my eldest found a book of cartoons I'd drawn uh, when I was about his age, oh, wow. and he redrew them all much better. Really? Which, yeah, it was a massive slap in the face. <laughs> so uh, that that sort of stuff, uh, you know, I was just a very normal 70s kid, uh, you know, um, very influenced. My parents sort of dropped out from their careers in the early 80s when I was around 15, and we moved um, and they became very, they role reversed for one thing, um, and they became very self reliant. And, um, and I sort of, so I, I grew up a quite a tight and closely knit family, which I always think, you know, didn't exactly, wasn't conducive to, to, to rebelling properly as a, as a kid. And I, uh, I always wonder whether that was a, a bit of a mistake. And then I was, you know, obviously spent a lot of time working very hard, got myself to Cambridge, which really wasn't likely because I'm, profoundly stupid or at least was at that time and and then I sort of you know it kind of unfolded from that did you work hard as an ambition to get to Cambridge or well I was just a I mean at one level I was just or a good school gas no no I mean I was dreadful uh rural comprehensives uh which w w you know I think actually state education is brilliant in Britain right now but it was terrible in the 80s uh so and, and I was a bit stupid so so it, it took a, a long time for me to kind of click but I did for my A-levels, so I worked really fucking hard. Um, somebody, I, I was going to go and do um, product design or packaging design, and, and, the, and the geography teacher said, oh, if you 
did geography go to Cambridge? And I went, oh, that sounds like a good idea. So that's that's really how that that all happened. And, and so I think I'm pretty much the only person who went to Cambridge. Uh, we, we I, I have three A levels, one in uh, design, uh, and uh, what, what was it? Subject called craft design technology. You know, I mean, most people that had like fifteen A levels, all in double maths. Right. I had a very bizarre collection of of qualifications. I'm not really sure I should be there at all. Uh, and I only say all of that because I think the mess that is is sort of my background. I mean, it's not a sort of you know a social mess or a, like I came. You know, I had a tough upbringing or anything like that. But I have just this sort of random jumble of influences and qualifications and things and i think that makes for a sort of interesting planner yeah. fodder if that makes it it's not very traditional yeah do you remember a first time or a reason why you, you got interested in product design when you were studying yeah i mean well i, I can tell you exactly i i i i fancied myself as as a designer i mean i think it genuinely just fancied myself as a designer because because i did uh, design o level that was the forerunner to gcse's in the uk and and and, and i failed you, you know so god knows why i thought i should go on and do a level um but, but so I, I found this subject that looked kind of cool. It was a combination of sort of practical uh, making the stuff that you designed and, and sort of theory that worked really well for me. And then uh, this is 1983, and I, I was reading a magazine and I, I read this story about this uh, British designer called James Dyson who was struggling to, to get a, a product off the ground and had managed to do a deal with the Japanese. Basically, I mean, as we know, it's like a legendary story now. it have been rejected by every uh, single vacuum cleaner manufacturer. And he managed to license the product initially, the Cyclone vacuum cleaner in Japan. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was a great sort of early 80s design because it's pink and grey. Uh, and uh, he then went on, I guess, by 93 to, to man manufacture uh, the Dyson himself and it was really that that made me think I want to do product design as opposed to graphic design or, you know product design industrial design and that was really what I wanted to to do for quite a long time until I, I sort of and I do sometimes look back and go gosh you know because you have those moments in your life you, where, where there were decisions and you may not no. you may not have sat down and made really weighty decision about it but you made a decision and, and, and it does it, you know it does influence your life path but yeah. you know was was the direction of uh, like going into from uh, account management to planning? Was that one of those decisions? Yeah, and I really kicked against it, which is bizarre because you know I thought I was working in a direct marketing agency. Uh, we all have our uh, you know CD backgrounds, and um, uh, I I uh, was an account handler. I was absolutely dreadful. I mean, awful, awful account in handler. In what ways? Well, you know, I think one one of the two. Or, I think one of the great qualities of an account handler is decisiveness. I had absolutely none. It makes me quite a good planner. And uh, the other thing is I hate making difficult phone calls. And uh, clearly that's a massive part of telling, you know, phoning up the client and telling them that uh, the whole project's gone tits up uh, uh, and getting away with it. It seems to be a, a you know, occupational hazard of being an account handler. It's terrible at all of that. And it was really my agency at the time, a uh, place called Barraclough Hall, Wollstone and Grey, which became Proximity in London. Okay. Um, uh, they they kind of went, it didn't actually say you're a useless account handler, but they did in a slightly passive aggressive way say, well, why don't you go to an agency called Abbott Me Vickers and l learn to be a planner? And I went, yeah, but you know, I'm an account manager in direct marketing. I mean, I, you know, I, 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 I'd be an account director and I wouldn't ever have got that far. You know, very shortly, I need to pursue my career in direct marketing. Uh, so I was definitely in the in the kind of realms of looking at gift horses in the mouth. And eventually, they packed me off, and I did six months learning to be a planner at Abbott Mead in the mid nineties. Uh, and clearly, I had absolutely was have done that. No. How did you learn it? Was it shadowing another planner, or? Well, I think ge genuinely, in the way that the, the, the lots of us learn, which is I just got thrown into the deep end. I mean, nobody at Abbott Mead wanted me there. I was just like, you know bloke that had turned up from a direct marketing agency they just happened to have recently bought nobody was the slightest bit interested uh yeah it's, it's, and i was like i felt made because i was you know i haven't made at long last it'd be a long time i had a you know rejected by them and the in, 
when I originally applied, and I was bad, you know, I felt felt like the place to be. Um, but it, like all of that, you 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 know, you 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 sort of dig around, you try and be useful, you try then to end up being invaluable. And by the end of that time, and my allotted six months, I'd I'd sort of created. A, I mean, I dug away on, a, on an account they had at the time, Delta Airlines, and, and um, made it difficult for them to, to send me back. Yeah. Um, the only brave thing I've ever done in my career was uh, I went to the uh, head of planning at the time and said, I'd, I'd like to be a planner here. And she said, well, we'll, we'll never poach people from sister agencies. So I went back to Merrick Barrack of Hall, Austin Bray. Uh, and uh, and resigned and went back to her and said, I don't work for a sister agency any longer. It's about the only brave thing I've ever done in a in a very uh, uh, kind of lacklustre career, frankly. <clears throat> oh, I don't think it's that lacklustre. <laughs> well, I don't know. You're probably exaggerating a little bit here. I mean, you you are, you are the chief strategy officer at Sachi and Sachi. Yes. like, you know, historical agency. One of the only agency names that people who don't work in advertising have actually heard of. Yes, which is, which is a, you know, a, 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 as much a millstone as it is a sort of, um, uh, you know, a... a, a a boost for us. I think inhabiting such a famous brand actually gives us a little bit of empathy with clients managing brands that perhaps have a bunch of great associations and a bunch of less great associations. Mm-hmm. Um, and you write a lot as well. So we, we mentioned Ad Literate and this is yeah. one of the things a lot of people in the industry know you for. Yes. Um, how did you start writing for and commenting about the industry? Like, and what did the where did the idea of blogging come about? Well, I mean, in, in all honesty, I mean, I know remember it really, really well. I did a talk, um, I think called the Financial Services Forum, and I was pitted as the advertising representative against uh, a guy from uh, Digital who turned out to be Mark Pridge, the founder of Glue, uh, now Ice Bar, uh, and uh, uh, somebody from PR and somebody from Direct, and and it was you know. It, it was a, a kind of debate on where should clients be spending their money. And I mm. made a very unfashionable uh, uh, at the time and probably still unfashionable plea that the vast majority of their budget should be in av- advertising. And I went really hard on it and, uh, and I was really proud of it, uh, this talk. I mean, um, and I, you, you turn up, I don't know, it happens to you, but sometimes you, you turn up and you're sort of imagining that in your mind there'll be 200 people sitting in front of you, you know, eagerly anticipating your every word. And I think I probably spoke to 30 people, like, uh, and I thought, okay, fine. And then I just knew nobody was ever going to phone up the agency or talk to me. And, and I got frustrated. There's a point to this eventually, mm-hmm. uh, that, um, you know, I'd done all that work and it was just going to disappear into the ether. So I thought, well, what, what, could I find a way to, to put stuff, uh, in a searchable place where possibly other people would come across it? And at the time, rather arrogantly, I thought, well, you know, journalists can find this stuff. Like it would be at all interesting. Um, and I, and I was, I went back to the agency and said, um, how do you build a website? And the person in charge of, IT at the time, this is HHCL, uh, so we had IT people who were interested in technology, which is very unusual in advertising these days, um, and uh, he said, well, oh, it would be thousands of pounds, and blah, 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 and I got really dispirited, and then a friend of mine just said, no, there's this, there's this blogging software, it's free, I had a movable type blog at the time, just do that, well, it's brilliant, so I never it- intended to to start a blog, I wanted just a sort of searchable place to put stuff. Um, so it was never, uh, it was never in a way a, a, a blog. And I, I guess originally I feel people felt frustrated because I would maybe write twice a month. And I remember having a conversation with Russell Davis, you know, legendary yeah. Atlan blogger, you know, at the time when he was saying, I've been advised I have to post twice a day. I can imagine that now. Well, I mean, that's what, you know, micro blogging has been invented for. Uh, but uh, so I never did that. So I never really felt I was creating a blog. Uh, b- but uh, I, uh, you know, blogging sort of came along and was the thing you know, provided this sort of cheap, easy, updatable software. Um, so I started doing that, and it started to have a life of its own. I mean, and, and the name is... Do you is, have a structure in terms of the way that you prepare posts to write them? Now? Or, uh, now, or that has evolved over the past, like, however no, many years? No, I mean, and, and I, 
you know, in fairness, so I'm doing started in March 2005, so it's now 11, 11 years of this. It, it, in fairness, it, it it's really difficult. I made this pact that I would only post my own work. I've once done a guest post, but but my own work, uh, and it would have to be something where I had a, a an original, or I thought original point of view. And it didn't matter whether it was, in a sense, whether I really believed it or not, the point was the provocation. Okay. Um, and so really, you know, I, I, I sort of, when there's stuff that pops into my mind, then I get excited and write. Um, but that's why it can seem slightly sort of spasmodic in its in its frequency um i mean there are some disciplines now i or i tend to want to write 600 words i think it's, it's if you're writing i i find the word count brilliant uh because it disciplines you um uh, uh i t- tend to i don't know do you have any techniques for like note taking when you have ideas for something? No, no, it should be be much better because I definitely do shit like I think that'd be brilliant and then completely forget what it was. And so I don't, uh, lots of people do that, but I, I, I mean, I don't do that. I tend to have an idea, start writing, to be honest. Um, and often, what what I'm writing about becomes apparent during that process. And, And sometimes, um, uh, I I end up writing something completely different to the thing I'd started. I mean, not not in its subject matter, but possibly the point of view. Um, yeah, so that uh, that's and I still love it. Um, I think that I'm a generation of people. Maybe it's got worse that you know left school able to write and then were de-skilled by the industry because we only ever communicated in PowerPoint. Yeah. And uh, the art of writing is lost. I find it real. I really struggle with younger planners now. Uh, not necessarily a generational thing. Just they're not very good at writing. And it frustrates me enormously. Mm-hmm. Um, and and uh, I so I set. Um, I took George Orwell as sort of a hero anyway, but as this model for writing. He wrote prolifically, and he also wrote prolifically about writing. Um, and a, a lot of the style is actually taken from his belief in brevity, um, uh, his loathing of tired and dead metaphor, all that sort of stuff. So I, I kind of, in presentation, I try to channel Ezzy Izzard, uh, and in writing, I try and channel George Orwell, which is That's a very... Brilliant. I just saw that Eddie Izzard was, uh, was live a few weeks ago. Yeah, I, yeah, I yeah, yeah. I didn't have the chance He's to see him. He's back on stage, yeah. I mean, I think... Uh, have you seen the latest it. show, or is, no, it, is it a remix of some previous stuff or new material? Do you know? Uh, I think it's pretty much new material. Uh, um, but all the re- reviews I've sort of it, it's it, it have read is a slight parody of Eddie Izzard. I mean, it's Eddie Izzard doing Eddie Izzard, uh, and uh, I'm, yeah, I think that's a, that's yeah. but he's a legend though. I mean, yeah. you know, doing twenty seven marathons simultaneously and or consecutively rather in South Africa or at the moment for sport relief. I mean, he is a legend. Um, but but I think I, I always tried. I just picked up a a desire to to channel his him. I mean uh, that's really arrogant. I didn't really mean I am trying to be Eddie Izzard. But no, no, but, but it's if an we were to talk about about you know writing style or presenting style, I don't think it harms to to look at people yeah. and go, I want to write a bit more like that, or I want to present a bit more like that. Yeah. So so you're saying so you you're saying that some of the young planners are. Well, dreadful not at writing. Dreadful at writing. Yeah. Fine, let's just say it. It's <laughs> easier. And one of the things they should do is read some George Orwell. Yes, yes. Any, anybody else they should be reading that you think would be really useful? Well, read, read. I mean, I, th- I think re- read great columnists, you know, people who are jo- whose job it is to communicate a point of view in 600 words or less. You, yeah. you know, um, I, I, I think... Being proud and enjoying writing. I mean, I, I don't know how you, how you find it, but it. So there is, of course, the tyranny of having to write. Yeah. But but there's a joy in writing, yeah. and there's also. I'm sorry, but there's a, a joy in rereading your work and thinking, yeah, yeah that was all right. Yeah. You know, I quite. I really enjoy it, and I, I've started writing a, a weekly newsletter. Right. Uh, because actually, that was one of the things I wasn't very. 
uh, discipline with my blog at all. I was just, I just kept thinking I need to post to my blog, but I'm not doing it. And then I thought, all right, well, if I start an email and I have people expecting it at a certain time, yeah. and a certain date, then I'm just going to, I'm going to do, I'm going to do that. And I, I now have that rhythm, uh, that I, every Sunday at 12, my newsletter goes out, like whatever sun, rain or shine, I, my newsletter goes out at that time. It tends to be a long form, uh, newsletter. Yeah. So 1500 to 2000 words. Well, okay. Uh, it's not a rule. It, could, it just happened to be that way. But I think so. People, people have their right, you know, their right length. They, 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 you know, some people are great at 400. I, I just really love the, the discipline of 600. Yeah. But I mean, uh, uh because you're getting into essay territory with, in, when you're in, yeah, in, it in starts the, getting into essay territory. 1200. Yeah. You know, and I think that's also an art form that's sort of been lost. Ian Leslie, great planner, uh, does does a lot of uh, longer form, long read writing on particularly on politics. Uh, so sometimes I think I think sitting down and, and or Malcolm Gladwell was you know the daddy of the yes. essay, yeah. uh, particularly for New Yorker. I mean I've never got to that. I, I mean I, I, there's another person. If I could do that thing, what I love about Malcolm Gladwell is he'll start. It'll be a story about I don't know. Uh, he'll be writing about parenting yeah, but he'll he start with a story about you know in Venezuela in 1926 there was a, a diamond mine. you know like a, where, where and I, I, I I'm, can't I can't do and that. links it up together oh, with you. I can do that but not for very I can, I can <laughs> and I I'm, I want to get better at it I can do that but I can right now do it for personal experiences not for very thoughtful things about the industry or about marketing or about brands or like yeah. not, I'm not yet like well certainly not like Gladwell um, but yeah. what do you think is one of your main strengths as a planner? I, I, I mean, I know, I know, I, I talk about this too much, and it's 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 too cliche. But I think one of the the great um, skills of a planner is to be able to see the world differently, and that's a cliche, and have a more interesting point of view on something that's very familiar. Most of the time we're being presented with brands or categories that are very familiar to consumers. And our job, in a way, is to defamiliarize them. Yeah. So I'm doing a lot of work at the moment on HSBC, particularly around wealth management. And I, I find it fascinating because I don't think that there is a, a category that is more um, uh, deluged in orthodox thinking mm. than financial services. I think it's because... People in our industry don't understand it and people in their industry can't explain it. And so uh, most work is trite and tired and boring and, you know, re retirement is always about uh, passions and, you know, investments are always about nest eggs because nobody has got the, 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 the wit, intellect or interest to do anything differently. And I, I, I sort of say all of that because because I think my job, is sort of go in and take all of those subjects and find a different perspective. And I think that's ultimately, yes, planners are there to, to structure and discipline and simplify and do all those great things that we do, you know, help brands and clients navigate culture and technology and uh, all of that good stuff. But, and, I, and this is the point I sort of was banging on about when we, when we met in uh, the European planning conference is, is yeah but the big the big bucks or at least the the big sort of personal rewards come from doing much more significant rethinking of categories or reframing of brands so that's still and, and so if you say what if i've got anything you know because I, I i don't actually genuinely believe i'm a particularly brilliant planner mm -hmm. but but I, I just have a sort of desire to to think something that other people haven't thought. And, and, and that's been, that's where blogging has been helpful because it's honed that. Yeah. And, 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 and as you said, like the ability to be, to, to express that different point of view and, and convince others well, that it's a valuable in, one. Indeed. And so, so the whole writing thing, we need to be able to convince, you know, you, we, we need to be able to convince our agency colleagues and clients um, of our point of view. And so we need to be able to be persuasive in person, but I also think we need to be persuasive, um, in other media and, uh, and, and, and 
being able to write is is a part of that. And I do think that there are times when you sit down and go, the way to explain this is in a deck. And then there are other times where you think, actually, the way to explain this is in one tightly written sheet of A4 Mm -hmm. that takes the client all the way through to the end. Because And after all, you know, what are creative briefs if they're not one page of tightly written yeah. uh, argument in, in a, that case to a creative team to convince them yeah, to, to the pursue direction. your direction yeah, yeah, yeah. you know yeah. so r- writing has still <laughs> got to be one of the most critical uh skills of a planner and uh and, and we you know i just think you know the planners out there just get better at writing. Mm. And for people who, who might be, because there's also people who listen to this and are not necessarily in the yep. advertising industry, yep. uh, but uh, who might be interested in writing. And if they look to the advertising and marketing industry, what do you think they can draw as lessons in terms of their improvement of writing or improvement of like whatever, like something to take in their own business? Yeah, don't look at us right now. I think, <laughs> you, you know, it's, it's to our eternal shame that we let, let copywriting die on the vine. Um, it still exists, I think, in in some agencies which still value long form copy, particularly the direct tradition, yeah. where you know you take time to persuade somebody of your point of view. But you know, I weep when I read, you know, burn back ads from the sixties. You know, I think I showed one at that conference forty three words to convince you to buy a Volkswagen. I mean, you know, I think. It's not just planners that have lost the art of writing well. Uh, it is to our great shame that, that creatives have as well, uh, because we have relentlessly pursued the concept of the conceptual idea at, uh, at great cost to some of the skills, the craft skills of our industry. So, yes, we have great, some astonishing ideas. You know, can, and they're just extraordinary ideas. Uh, but we've lost a, 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 a craft in our industry. Maybe, maybe that's because of time pressures. Maybe that's because clients no longer value it. Maybe consumers no longer value it. But I think it's sad. Mm. Do you think, uh, so just, to, just to go over a little bit of like some of the buzzwords and conversations going around, a lot of people are worried and talking about ad blockers at the moment. Yes. That, you know, well, everybody is justifiably, I think justifiably installing on their computers. Uh, do you, is it a concern that you're also playing with? Are you hearing a yes. lot of conversations? Lots of conversations. Sort of actually, in a weird way, not from clients at the moment. So clients aren't saying, well, what's the agency's point of view on, on ad blockers? I mean, I have a, a view that at the moment clients, I mean, I wrote about this last weekend, but uh, this is a bit harsh, but that clients don't know or care where their advertising is appearing right now. Um, uh, so, so actually, I think they're woefully naive about uh, the rise of ad blockers. The people that are talking to us about that are the publishers because yeah. they are shitting themselves. Yes. Um, uh, and uh, the people that, you know, have a conversation with people from, from, from the newspaper industry recently. And, and I, but I, I've got to say, you know, I, I, I've got to say they brought it on themselves. Uh, they've treated their readers with uh, utter disdain. Um, and, I, and I think, you know, an unholy alliance of the ad tech industry um, have yet to prove their case, by the way. I think, you know, they seem to survive largely because there are deep pockets in venture capitalists, not actually because anybody's making any real money. Yeah. Uh, and publishers who were greedy or at least panicking about print uh, the death of print and uh, and agencies who've produced an absolutely woeful product. Uh, no wonder people installing ad blockers. And there's a bit of me that kind of goes, bring it on, because you, you, you know uh, I think I think the industry deserves being punished for one thing, uh, and I also think that um, you, you know whenever there's a decline in in supply, the quality of stuff gets better, and and I think that. That's also possible. Mm. I do buy the argument that, that ad blocking is not really a kind of uh, championing of consumer rights. It is really, a, I think the culture secretary in the UK described it as a scam. And I think it probably is a scam. You know, the whole cu- culture of whitelisting and paying to be whitelisted. I mean, it, yeah. 
But anyway, uh, I, I think it's a, it's, so that was one, one sorry, a long rambling answer no, no, to me. one thing about ad blocking. That's all where I am on ad blocking. I'd, I'd like to, to, to figure a, a way through, but I, I uh, hate the defensiveness around ad blocking. I kind of think mm-hmm. we, we brought that on ourselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Another question that comes just because it's such a ridiculously common buzzword right now, uh, and your content. Yes. We're all talking about content at the moment, or at least that's one of the words I see repeated and talked about all over and over and over again. And everybody is hailing it as the answer to everything. Also because it's a catch-all phrase or catch-all word that can mean just about everything. Uh, are you hearing that one a lot as well? And, and what do you think of the, this idea that, you know, well, of content to replace advertising? Yeah. I mean, now content, I think is much more, established you know and, I, and we have a big business in in uh, generating content um and i'd actually say that our content business at sarchi and sarchi is is as big as our advertising business um because actually the, the, it was very easy to move skills from uh, persuasive advertising to engaging content i mean it wasn't it wasn't a hard thing all we had to crack was the the ability to to do it at High quality, low cost, mm. and and quick. Yeah. Uh, so I mean that took a while, but uh, but uh, pe- yeah, agencies like ours got there very quickly. Um, I, I you know where where I get to on content is I think the case for content is unproven commercially. Uh, I think a lot of people are spending a lot of money and a lot of energy and effort um creating stuff that's never seen or never seen by a sufficiently large number of people uh, to make it worth having done it in the first place um i think there's a lot of bullshit talked about uh content driving and media where we've now realized that there is no such thing as earned media everything's paid for in one shape or form uh, and if you want your content to reach anybody online you'll be paying for it in much the same way as you pay for advertising. So, um, I'm very cynical about the content argument, though it clearly has, content has a, has a role at, at different points in the purchase process, uh, and it can be incredibly powerful close into the purchase, mm. uh, to help people guide or guide people through, um, making the right purchase decision, what they need to know, all that sort of stuff. But I think as with everything, you know, it's got a, it's rightful place, but you, you know, you, Nothing is the answer to everything. Uh, and I, I think one of the sad things about our our industry over the last decade or so is that everything new that we've discovered, we've decided is the answer to everything. And yeah. I think there's an ecosystem. And I, I mean, I, I love, there's a book by a guy called Paul Feldwick, who was a long time planner at an agency called BMP in London. Um, and uh, he's written a book called The Anatomy of Humbug, uh, terrible, terrible title, but you know, in, in it he sort of advances the argument that um, that that all of this is helpful to what we do. And it's just a question of deciding when you use social, when you use content, when you use advertising, uh, when you use sort of rational advertising, when you use emotional advertising. Everything has a place. Yeah, you know. So yeah, uh, yeah I feel cool. cynical. No, you so. know, and, and I, 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 I st- what's been weird because I set out that on ad literate to be contrary it sort of started being anti-advertising uh, in 2005 and it was you know all about new media and uh, and then particularly the kind of purpose um philosophy and brand building and i, and I f- find that you know now now that because that was new and unorthodox now I end up looking at, I mean, I really don't want to be Bob Hoffman. I don't want to be ad contrarian. I don't want to be a sad old git. He's not, but I don't want to be, you know, a, a old bloke whinging about new stuff. But I do find that now the edgy counter orthodoxy is in saying all this stuff seems like it's unproven. Yeah. But interestingly, purpose has also come back to the forefront of these days. Like yeah. That's something that brands are starting to look at and yeah. companies are starting to look at. Yeah. Or at yeah. least starting to put some proof behind it, I think, no? Yes, it is. And I love it. And I've always loved it. And, and in the right place for the right brands, it, it's, it could be 
incredibly powerful, but we have slightly swallowed the gospel according to Simon Sinek. And everything's about why. And, you know, I did a project recently, go to a client, go, you're a how, you're a how brand, not a why brand. And that's okay, you know. I think it's all right uh, um, to, to have different solutions and and as so i wrote a piece a little while ago saying saying i don't you know not every brand needs a purpose yes some brands are purposeful some brands are just really good at what they do i mean going back to dyson you know, love lot lifelong love affair with that brand i sort of think it doesn't have a purpose it just is a really good vacuum cleaner it does the job brilliantly that's why i bought it and i'm really i'm really happy with that and i'll go buy another one when this one breaks down yeah yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Um, just conscious of time, so I usually finish with a few cool down questions. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Hopefully not about, you know, my no, past no, no, childhood. No, no, no. Well, I mean, uh, you, we can talk about that, but they're, they're slightly different. But uh, I've got to have, I, it's the Ice Cream for Everyone podcast, so I've got to have an ice cream question. Here's the question. Uh, what is a favorite food of yours that you think deserves to be made into an ice cream? That you haven't yeah. tried, obviously. Yeah, well, I, I, I'm I having an obsession with Vietnamese food at the moment. I mean, basically all of it. I, mean, I, I just think anybody who decided to combine French cuisine with Asian cuisine is a genius. Uh, it's the best uh, food uh, uh, form in the world. And I think banh mi ice cream is what a I... Banh mi ice cream? Yeah. That's, why that, that's something for. I have to talk about with my brother. You know, my brother is a chef. And <laughs> no. My brother is a chef, and uh, both my brothers are chefs. Okay. And he's about think, to open a new Asian restaurant in London. Okay. Uh, and I think a bad <laughs> ice cream sounds like a, an interesting challenge because there's so many different flavors in there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Very interesting. All right, cool. Uh, and another one that we were just talking about before we started recording is uh, my interest in games. Yeah. And that you, uh, after a conversation that we had uh, when we met in Prague at the European Planning Conference, yeah. you got a couple of board games that you started playing with your family. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about the experience playing, uh, well, Settlers of Catan, I think it is? Yeah, I mean, I've got to thank you for that because... It, you know, it's very rarely you go to a planning conference and come away with a, a Christmas present for your eldest son and then latterly a birthday present for your younger son. Uh, so that was big value. Uh, so thank you for that. You're I, welcome. I, I, you inspired me uh, because I hadn't really ever grasped what was going on in tabletop gaming and that it got, got kind of, it was getting very exciting and interesting. And um, so we, we, we bought Settlers of Catan and... Uh, we love it. I mean, we play, I was saying we play it every weekend, uh, and we've sort of got to that stage where we're, we're doing bespoke, uh, setups and trying to figure out c kind of the intricacies of game, the gameplay. Uh, what I love about that is, is, is for me, most board games in my life start off interesting and sort of tail off. And in the end, you end up just giving up playing that game of Monopoly, mm. whatever it is. And I love the way Catan builds to this sort of crescendo of frenzied excitement. Um, and, and we're also playing Pandemic, which is a, which is a cooperative game. And it, it, it's great to sort of sit down with family and, I mean, of a Sunday evening and cure four global diseases it yeah. feels like an achievement yes. uh, before bedtime, <laughs> before bedtime. <laughs> so I'm, I'm excited about that I, you inspire me there's a one you, you talked about called zombie side which I think for, for, for my eldest I figured out it was a bit much for my younger son but uh, I, I'm, that's what I want to get yeah, next that's a, it's a big one that can, that can last for a long time okay. the, games. the games can last for a long time pandemic's really really long well, but pandemic Quick, it's quick. I mean, yeah, I think people quicker. imagine board Zombicide games. So you've got to have long. four hours. Yeah. Pandemic, forty-five minutes. You know, we, we're playing at the moment to make it last a bit longer because it genuinely feels a bit quick. But yeah, yeah. Uh, but actually, we were talking about like what, what happened to make uh, these new board games yeah. into a trend, and I think the new a new type of design to make the games shorter is also a trend that is uh, that it's worthwhile to change this whole thing of like board games taking four hours they're like massive scale yeah uh, a lot more of them are very very short escape is another one that might be worth checking out in a very very short time frame it's kind of like there's different themes but one of them is a uh, kind of raiders of the lost ark and you're yeah. adventurers in the thing and it's time so you have like two minutes two minutes so you have to go super fast and help each other to get out of this kind of temple thing uh, which is quite Good fun as well. No, and I think maybe you, there's something we can learn there about time 
time relevant. So, I mean, we played pandemic on Wednesday evening, you know, because school night, mm. because, because it's sort of done in 45 minutes and popped off to cook tea after that, you yeah, know. Yeah. Uh, um, but, but actually, I mean, for me, there's something going on. We'll figure it out about the gameplay, which you're sort of not really getting in, in, um, uh, kind of online gaming yeah. qu quite in the same way there's a depth of gameplay I think it's extraordinary yeah yeah absolutely great uh, thank you very much for having this conversation so people can find you online on your website it's yes at adliterate yep uh, and on uh, that's your twitter handle as well right? Ad, at adliterate yeah that's that's right um, yep. more the merrier uh, are you going to be speaking at any events or anything that people can see you at in a short do you know like, what no so this or? is an inv invitation I'd love to to be doing more this year. At the moment, there's not much planned in. Okay, cool. Perfect. Thank you. Great. Thank really you. enjoyed that. Yeah. Brilliant. All right. Another episode gone. Uh, that was a fantastic conversation. Thank you so much for listening to the end. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did enjoy it, how about sharing it with a friend? Uh, that's what I asked. All I want is for more people to listen to the show, really. And if you've enjoyed it, just tell somebody else about it. There's going to be somebody else. There's got to be somebody else, you know, who works with brands or marketing or advertising or just might enjoy the fun conversation that we had or maybe went to Cambridge. Go figure. I have no idea. Who just, you know, send them a link to the file by email uh, or share it on your favorite social network and put it on Twitter, put it on Facebook. There's probably buttons for that somewhere, wherever you're listening. Or ideally, it's just make it a personal note. If you know one person in particular who's going to be enjoying it, then send them just, you know, I guess an email, right? Uh, of course, you can always find more Ice Cream for Everyone goodies, uh, stuff to read, stuff to listen to. So I usually comment about marketing in my blog. Uh, but of course, there's the Ice Cream Sunday newsletter. That's the main thing I've been putting a lot of time and effort in lately, aside from the podcast. Uh, and uh, as I said at the beginning, they're a collection of kind of more long form essay-ish. I mean, I don't dare saying it's an essay because really I go from personal memories and try to make connections with different things I'm interested in. Um, they're published on medium.com, but you really get them first via email and you can register on the main website. That's www.icecreamforeveryone.net. Uh, I'm just finishing a contract at the moment. So if ever you're looking for strategic advice, marketing advice uh, for your brand, for your business, or just want to talk about a bunch of different ideas, talk about games, because well, that's one thing I really love talking about. And I'm working on my own game designs on the side. I don't know. Well, I, I don't have no idea when that's going to come out. It's coming like working on it slowly, slowly. Uh, so yeah, follow all the updates on the Facebook page for Ice Cream for Everyone or on Twitter. I'm at, at HippoWill. And uh, I guess that's about it for now. There's going to be another episode coming out very soon. Uh, more exciting episodes coming out. So look out for that. And have a fantastic end of, you know, whatever it is, morning, day, evening, night. Have fun and uh, see you soon. Bye. <music>